Hello, my friends. A few minutes ago, just when I wanted to start, started raining and winding, so I quickly run down to get an umbrella in case it's going to blow the rain inside. So far, it's okay. On the spiritual path, all kinds of experiences may happen. And they may be very different from one to another. Some people practice a little and start to have all kinds of experiences that they practice for a long time, often thinking nothing is happening but at least still something is happening. And each story is unique. We can get inspiration from others who have gone their way sincerely. We can borrow a bit. <laughs> with that inspiration from their sincerity. But their story is their story, your story is your story, my story is my story. <laughs> they just simply differ. And it's good so. so you shouldn't try to imitate others. Everyone has to learn to be in touch with that essence, with that reality, with God, with the self. And then let the story unroll. And there are all kinds of funny things may happen. I'm saying this because Matt, a friend that I haven't seen for nearly 30 years, he used to come down into the cave and he used to talk through the bars of my door. <laughs> and though obviously recently he stumbled on YouTube on our satsang here until he made again contact. <clears throat> and he is still continuing his meditation all these years. And recently things started to happen there were openings and at a certain time there was really a strong opening and suddenly the teachings of Nisargadatta Maharaj started to make sense. We're hearing Amma singing Bhajan, suddenly he felt she's not singing to Krishna but as Krishna. And the great overwhelming bliss was in connected with this opening. As the time passed, then that subsided again, but still there something has been different since then. And he's experiencing in many things an aloofness which he didn't know before. And even when the ecstatic period passed after that, all kinds of experiences were there, less ecstatic, sometimes with pressure in the head and suddenly the thoughts are going quite crazy. And yet throughout that, that aloofness was there. 
And so he was wondering, is this a good thing? Is this, am I just getting crazy? <laughs> is this normal that this is happening? That was his question. And I have to tell you, Matt, <laughs> there is nothing you can say that is normal. Or you can say it's normal that things start to happen in a way that we did not anticipate. It may shatter sometimes a bit our world view, our perception, how we are perceiving the world. <clears throat> But then how this is manifesting the experiences, they are changing, they are different from one to another. Sometimes there are just, it's an experience, it comes, it's there for a moment, it goes. Sometimes an experience comes and stays and is there for a period and gradually subsides. Or sometimes there is an experience, there is an opening, and it simply stays, and it's there. But then somehow we have to learn to integrate it in our day-to-day -day experience, in our day-to-day -day life. And what was quite amazing and unusual after some time is the new norm, personal. No. And so it goes. Sometimes uh, when things are a bit fun, one may wonder, am I just getting crazy? It happened to Matt and he was wondering whether he should reduce or withdraw for some time from the meditation practice, but then he has a picture of Ramana Maharshi standing on his table and he felt when looking at that picture very strong, the message, no, no, continue. And that was a good message. <laughs> By all means, Matt, continue. <clears throat> what is the difference between a person who is getting crazy and a mystic? who starts to experience things that are not in the usual mainstream norm of the human experience. Both the crazy people and the mystics may experience things that the other people don't experience. And what's the difference? <coughs> the difference is very simple. If one gets unbalanced and crazy and more unbalanced, more crazy, it's like a whirlpool and the experiences that one is on the periphery of that and is just being turned around helplessly as a victim, desperately trying to make sense of what is happening and then usually desperately trying to other people to explain their situation, which usually, usually just leads to more craziness because the other people don't believe or they start to say the fellow is crazy. And there's a lot of suffering, a restlessness, trying to make sense, trying to have, so have something stable, trying to have something real. What is real? What is not real? Is it all just nonsense, crazy nonsense that I'm experiencing? And so a crazy person usually suffers from that. That is not rooted, not centered. And we have to somehow find the way that if this is happening, to come to the center of that whirlpool. And we are getting there by learning to be in the present. Learning to connect with that which is not changing. 
learning to get rooted in that. That is the difference between the crazy person and the mystic. The mystic is rooted in something totally stable. No matter how strange things are going on, whatever is happening around them, in the surroundings or as a personal experience, as long as one is rooted, there is no way that one can get crazy. Just be strongly connected. And whenever we become aware that we are not consciously connecting, come back to that, get rooted in that, and then not, nothing can really shake you up. We don't have to somehow desperately try to keep our experience in the stream of the human norm. We can very well have things that would be considered totally crazy. We can very well change our opinions, our standpoint totally that would be considered crazy as long as you are rooted in this timelessness of the now. As long as, even if you are not firmly rooted, but as long as you are always coming back to that and learn to relax in that and learn to have faith in that and learn to have that strength that comes out of it then one is not in danger of getting crazy. It doesn't matter whether others have had similar experiences, whether we can go and confirm with them, ah, oh, you also had that, uh, so this is normal. It may not be normal at all, what's going on, what's happening to us on the path. <laughs> Never mind. Then is the time to rely on self-confidence and not on the feedback of others. Not that we must find a certain fake security if somebody confirms to us what is right and what is wrong. And you consciously connect and learn to be in touch with that and learn to relax in it, then there comes a great strength with it. And it's good to understand this is good. I can rely on that. I can even increase that strength, open up that I'm becoming stronger and stronger and then may co come anything, whatever. Even if it's sometimes going through rough, rough waters on the surface, there is always that awareness deep down, there is something that is not affected by it. Deep down, there is something that cannot be shaken up. However, the image, <clears throat> of the world is being shaken up, sometimes comes crashing down. There is something that is simply without acting on it, but simply naturally witnessing the whole story, being aware of it, but being not affected by it. There is no danger of becoming crazy if we do that, no matter what is happening. After all, when we start out looking for truth, seeking, trying to find God, trying to get enlightened, trying to get self-realized, there is always that longing to go beyond the usual human experience. 
And something is eagerly waiting for that, but then at the same time, when things start to happen in a way we do not expect, then uh, that fear can be there. And that hanging on to the old view, to the old reality, just to get back that little sense of security one has developed with it. But it's a fake security. The real security comes simply out of the experience that I am here now, immovable, sitting like a rock, no matter what is happening. If you increase that faith, if you increase that self-confidence, then nothing can really shake you up to the bottom, even if on the surface it may be often overwhelming what is happening. All right, I leave that subject. <clears throat> and then I come to a question of Maria. The last clip prepared by Mari and posted on YouTube was about faith, faith in God and not being directed by desires and fears. And she said uh, it's very timely because it's a subject that is really touching her very much these days. That question of faith in God. Because whenever she wants to open her heart and she really connects with that faith, then also a fear comes, a fear of God. <laughs> Shouldn't be there, for God is the most natural existence. But of course, as she herself then says, it is certainly very much influenced by her Catholic upbringing. And the picture of God that is transmitted there is rather there is a God there, always watching very carefully whether we're behaving or not. And as soon as we are not behaving, ready to punish. <laughs> of course, if that uh, is the mood one has with God, then uh, fear will come. It's a pity that in all the three Semitic religions, in Judaism, in Christianity, in Muslim, Muslim uh, in Islam, <laughs> that fear of God is very much kindled in people. On a very basic, rather barbaric level, that may be helpful that people at all start to behave somewhat. But God is our true essence. You are that divine yourself. You may not be God ruling <laughs> the creation, but your essence is that same divinity. And so we should not have fear of God. But the most innocent, open heart for that, feeling attracted. Why? Because it is our true nature. But anyhow, we have been brought up the way we have been brought up and certain hang-ups are there and certain conditionings are there and if we are aware of that then it's good to see them and it's good to understand we need not keep them we need not keep like when we want to have faith the fear that comes along with it and we can see that see how it is manifesting see what it's doing to our experience and learn to relax and learn to let it go. 
a whole world experience is so much shaped by all the conditioning that has been put in our mind, how we should be, how we should not be, how, what we should expect, what we should not expect, how things are and how things are not. <laughs> that gives a very rigid structure. And if we never introspect, then we may live our whole life and moving within that rigid structure till the end of the life. Not being aware how tremendously it is limiting, limiting the potential of consciousness, of expanding, that we keep on squeezing consciousness within that rigid structure which invariably is painful because the natural movement of consciousness is to be expensive. And if we don't let that happen and live within the structure of the conditioning, it's a painful business and people suffer. So very good to be aware when this kind of tendencies come up, that we see them clearly, see, okay, it has been in my life till now, but it is time to let it go. It is not in any way supporting, it is not in any way protecting, it's simply an obstacle to go beyond it. We cannot just decide I don't want them to be there. They are still there. But we can be alert. And when they come up, then deal with them in such a way that they are getting weaker and eventually dropping off and are not more standing in the way of our direct, immediate experience of God, of the self, of reality. Okay, I leave also this subject, but then I come up to a subject. Mariam has mentioned, he said, well, how do we know, or who is a right guru, or not the right guru? And is it necessary to have one guru? Can one have different gurus? <laughs> what is all that story with the gurus? <laughs> it depends also what one means with the word guru. It's also used in different ways. <clears throat> For me, guru means really somebody who is capable of connecting with a seeker and is capable of leading and supporting that seeker in a direction that that seeker becomes more and more self-aware and self-confident that the guru eventually becomes superfluous. But then often the guru, guru is, the word is used just as a teacher. And if we look at the word like that, yes, we can have different teachers. And that guru, shishya relationship I just mentioned before, that is something that cannot be artificially brought about. So we don't have to run around and try to find who and do, where is my guru. Just be sincere on your path. And there you can have different teachers. And if there is a confusion of the teachings that one teacher says one thing, another teacher says the other thing, then one has to learn to really listen to oneself, to one's res resonance with it. And if there is something that vibrates along with a certain teaching and one feels, yes, it's good for me now at least, then that teaching is helpful. And we can, like that also, Learn to be more confident in self-confident. Have confidence in our own experience. 
How can we know who is a real guru or, or a charlatan? In order to know for sure, one would have to be in the same state like that guru. <laughs> but we can still listen to our heart and feel if there is a resonance, if the one feels basically at ease with somebody, even if being with that guru is not always easy. <laughs> and it's not simply uh, floating on pink clouds, but if there is in the heart a knees with a guru, then one can have the faith this is maybe not absolute, maybe not ultimate, but for me here now, this is the right direction, this is the right teaching. And if it has to happen that the real guru shishya relationship is being established, then actually it's initiated rather from the side of the guru. But one can learn. Again here, people are different. Some people just need somebody to hold on to and they will find their teacher and stay with their teacher and that teacher becomes their guru. <clears throat> Some people don't like too much, hang on to somebody. And they are not handicapped because of that, because the ultimate guru is our own self. And we can always totally open up to our own true nature. This is the final guru. And then on the way, things will be arranged. If we need some support, if we need some direction, then a teacher may appear, give us what we need at that time, and then somehow disappear again from our life. And another teacher may be there. It may happen that different teachers are there, each one bringing an aspect. But don't go out because of that teacher hunting and think uh, the more teachers I, I collect, the more wisdom I'm getting. No, because it can be confusing. People, teacher, teachers are using different words. And so it may sound very confusing listening to one teacher and then to another teacher. Follow your heart. You don't have to restrict now your activities to just one teacher and somehow try to screen out everything else. But follow your heart. Like with the question that was the last time or recently was there about when people come and tell, tell you to come somewhere and you don't feel like going there, then just rely on that. And rely on that when you feel attracted to a teaching, even if you are also following another teacher, then you can integrate that teaching in your path. In my story, when I met Amma, it became very clear, she is my guru. <laughs> so that looking out for the guru, that stopped. Actually, I had already stopped before, and then she appeared. <laughs> and she just grabbed me, and I didn't have a chance. <laughs> but still, I got a lot of inspiration being with Amma, doing my practice, but I got a lot of inspiration listening to talks of other teachers. I kept on the first four years listening, uh, reading in the book of Nisargadatta, I kept on reading Ramana Maharshi's talks. I kept on reading the Yoga Vasista, which was very inspiring and important for me. And I feel a very strong connection to Sri Vasista Maharshi. And yet, this was not creating a conflict because 
somehow I felt I'm there connected with Rama. She's my guru. And this is teaching that comes and enriches that relationship. That it's not a contradiction. So don't be afraid if you get information, inspiration from different directions. Just don't let it confuse you. Integrate it in your own unique way. And there you are in a way carving your own unique path. Okay, I'm also dropping this subject. And finally, I stop just talking and talking and asking you, my friends, <laughs> is there anyone who would like to come? Arion Bana. Arion Maria. Thank you for addressing the topic and the fear of God. Um, yes, I would like to talk because I feel when I talk, uh, more things happen. <laughs> and I feel this is the one, the most important topic for me right now. And it comes within the a wider understanding of the power of, of beliefs. Yes. It's like recently I understood that like, like our matrix is made of beliefs. Yes. So yeah, it's whatever is being the conditioning in the mind. And so the perception of life it really is filtered through beliefs. Um so that was when I felt more strongly that if, again, intellectual, I think I've mentioned it before, intellectually, I fully understand that um, there is one God, that creation is, is just impossible to put into words, the beauty of it, the wonder of it. Um, to me, there is order. I have no question about that intellectually, that there is divine order. And so the final question is, I think, uh, one of these scientists, um, famous scientists, ask, said the, the most important question is to, to know whether the universe is a friendly universe or not. You know? So at the end is whether God is, is friendly or not. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> if God is friendly, no problem. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> everything depends on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but if there is a doubt or a question about it, then is when it becomes scary yeah and so intellectually i have no doubt and also it's like it wouldn't make any sense to create to give birth to all of us to his children and this wonder the planets the stars and everything for what you know if it wasn't for a, something positive mm. so intellectually i understand it so it's the emotional level what i'm dealing with and at the emotional level, there are moments, and I know I need, I need to dig deeper. I need to do the steps that you always mention, the, the see it, uh, feel what is doing to your body, what um, center and, and relax um, through that process. I, you know, when, when it arises, the fear is like the, the image is a dark, a really black, like a black hole. And the memory I have, the most scary memory I have is hearing uh, in my family, the God punishes without a stone or a stick. Mm -hmm. So the punishment will come and you won't see it. You know, it's not visible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you will feel it. Yes. <laughs> so... And the other thing is that there is like a, a vacuum of hearing that God is love, yeah. you know, which is something that I started hearing when I started practicing meditation and reading about Hinduism. And it was like, wow, you know, I can't remember that in my childhood. And it's so many years of, of training, <laughs> yeah. of religious training, because I went through my entire schooling, university included. Yeah. in a Catholic environment. So that image of God as a punishment that, that has that side is basically 
power, control, and if you don't behave well, punishment. Is um, and as I'm saying it, I'm feeling the heat, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, which I feel is, is a good heat. Is is healing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I feel is what I'm. My work is dismantling that that image of God as uh, punishing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So if you could comment on that, it would be great. Yes, that basically the same. What I said right in the beginning, you don't need to keep up these beliefs any longer, even if they may have had their values. Even they could be you. They could be used as instrument for education to keep children and after that grown ups in line how they behave. But it's, it's a very small thing. It's so narrow and consciousness doesn't want to stay in that. If we simply behave because we are afraid of punishment, then consciousness cannot flourish, cannot expand. And of course, there, when God is pictured like this, although they say, don't make an image of God, then this is very much an image that has been created. Like the friendly old man who can get very angry and will punish you. So the, all these human weaknesses, they are projected into God. Yes. Right. And we can really seriously, when we see them, let go of them. God is not uh, some kind of of a more informed human about behaving with all this human quality, <laughs> qualities. God is the essence. God is that energy that makes everything possible. You can call it the, the essence. You can call it the self. You can call it God. God is that which makes you capable of hearing, thinking, feeling, smelling, tasting, to have any experience without that essence, absolutely nothing could manifest. It is that living quality that is here now in every moment and that has not human qualities like this, like uh, uh, rewarding and punishing and uh, having favorites for <laughs> behaving properly and <laughs> kicking the others out for not behaving properly. These are all human imaginations and then very much enforced by the institutions like the church because it comes in very handy as a power tool. Then uh, if you can get people scared and tell them either you behave how we say and you will be saved and go to heaven or you go to hell and you shall be punished, then uh, that gives a lot of power to the church and, uh, and the politics. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And we can we can really drop that, drop all that stuff. And just when the fears come, then yes, not argue intellectually with them. When the when these old habits come up from the upbringing, then see them, see what they are doing, and just let go, let go, let go, and not have a doubt. Should I maybe still keep it? because there is some use in it. There is no more use in it. <laughs> it's time to let it all go. You know, the thing I, I find very difficult also to accept, one part of myself finds very difficult, the, like the child, the scared child, is to, to believe that God wants me to be happy, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Happy and, and that there is no limit mm -hmm. to the happy. Yes. Um, feeling that is I've never heard that <laughs> I mean that's that's a you know as a child never ever heard about um, the permission to be happy yeah yeah that uh, simply they left out huh? <laughs> totally <laughs> <laughs> right 
And then as a revelation, it comes that actually an aspect of your true nature, an aspect of that divinity is joyousness, is that joyousness of existence. All our happiness comes out, out of that. And it's there for the taking. It's always offered. And we have so much resistance and so many conditionings that we are afraid to take it, that we don't want to take it, that we are not daring to be open, to be happy. But happiness is a natural state of existence and we have the full right to be happy. And if you are not disturbing it, then just naturally, automatically, that intensity of it is just continuously increasing. Thank you. What comes up when you talk like this is the the other big one, which is <clears throat> the death of Jesus, the story of the death of Jesus. Yeah. Which was, I mean, for for until I was a good grown up, um, that was the role model. The spiritual role model was Jesus, and because the teachings came through the church, obviously the the version that came was the the conservative one that he had sacrificed for us and that, um, yeah, we were sinners and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So how do you, I mean, your perspective on this, what is it? I don't have that perspective anymore. You know, I know that to me these days, the way I see is um, Jesus uh, for me um, carry the light of Christ, which is unconditional love. And God's avatars come in different shapes with different missions mm. um, at different times. And, and I still don't, I can't claim that I understand, but I am quite at peace with the story. But still there is, there is that doubt that why um, such a pure heart had to suffer. Mm -hmm. Where I had to be sacrificed, although these days I understand better, he was not the body, and perhaps that was part of the mission to to show I'm not the body, I'm not the mind. You know, I don't know what what, what could you comment on that? Because that was a heavy, heavy uh, load on me. Uh, the story of Jesus and his death. Yeah. Right. It of course has then after that been turned and uh, very much build up on that that Jesus has sacrificed and he what the church tells us through that sacrifice he, he takes the sins of his believers and that's why he had to suffer for the sake of his believers that they mm. can be saved which of course gives the poor fellow in the street already continuously a, a bad conscience that the yes. poor Jesus had to suffer because of me, <laughs> because yeah. I'm a sinner and doing all these bad things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> well, well. I don't know exactly what happened there historically. <laughs> no. Jesus also, we know his story somewhat till he was 12 years old and then only when he was 30 years old and started to be active. And many say he was traveling extensively in Asia, studying with yogis and Zen masters and Tibetan masters. Somehow, if that really is played the way it is described and he was hanged on the cross and actually usually these people suffer hell for quite a long time and he re relatively after a short time apparently was dead. If he was such a master yogi, it's very well possible that he threw himself in a samadhi state and uh, appeared yeah. to be dead. And after that, his resurrection was simply that uh, he put the life force again in his body. <laughs> and yes, yes and went actually away. Because others also say that after that, he again, he was living in Asia and actually in 
North India and Kashmir, I think. Uh, there is a grave of Jesus when he was supposedly died there as an old man. So I'm not saying it is like this, but it's, yes. it's very possible that it's not the story that uh, ended like this there. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, somebody tells Yes, I've is, seen the, the note, yeah. The, the, yeah. There is a book, right. Uh, I've seen different books and different uh, people have different theories about it. <laughs> so I just cannot say I know mm -hmm. what happened to Jesus, but his public performance that he was not afraid, that he faced the authorities and went through with them, it could also have been a great inspiration for people to do not be afraid of external circumstances, but be true to themselves and believe in their own strength. And after that, well, maybe he never died, but was simply in a samadhi state. <laughs> he wasn't suffering. That story that he did that in order to take up the sins of all the followers that come after that in the centuries to come and maybe the millennia to come, this is something the church has invented. Jesus hasn't said anything like this. Anyhow, the Bible as it exists has been modified very much in the early Christian time by the councils in the Vatican together with politicians forming a teaching that is very useful for their purpose of having yes. a power position. And, but still, a, a lot of indications are, have survived that help us that, I mean, Jesus was accused by the, at that time, religious authority uh, you, how can you, you're blaspheming, you say you are the son of God, it is, uh, and, and uh, how can you talk like this, and you, and he, he confirmed, yes, I am the son of God, but you are all my brothers and sisters. Yeah. He, he didn't say, I'm the only son of God, like the church of the dead advocated. He said, yes, I'm the son of God and you also. And what you think I'm doing great things, you all will do things like this and mm -hmm. greater than that. Yeah. <laughs> he, yeah. he kept on, even they, were, they have cen censored very much uh, the sayings. There, there is a time and again, something is left that points to that Jesus has not told anything else but of the divine nature of the people, and not that they are inherently sinners and poor, poor he has to suffer help <laughs> because people are so much sinners and so that he can save them. That is a story the church created. We don't have to take it like that. What exactly was his motivation to, that he went through with his crucifixion, I cannot say. Yeah. But uh, it's certainly not in order to, through that act, after that, atone for the sins of his followers. But uh, if a being like that is doing such thing, it it is harnessing a lot of power on this level and that is being released and the uh, people who tune into that Jesus consciousness, even if it's distorted with all kinds of doctrines, they're benefiting from that. You mm. can also ask why would Ramana Maharshi, after being fully established in the self, he kept on sitting and sitting and sitting for years. It is his way of harnessing a tremendous power on that, on this level. That people who tune into that being, Ramana Maharshi and his teachings, they're getting benefited by what he has done. And I'm sure uh, something like that happened uh, with Jesus and his story. Yeah. But somehow 
I have never really, for some time I was very interested and read also these kind of books who, who tell alternative stories, so also that they mutually may contradictory, <laughs> and then sort of lost a bit interest and would rather withdrew from that. So I'm not an expert <laughs> because yeah. I didn't put my energy into it to really go deeper and deeper into that. <clears throat> when I think of Jesus, that there is no doubt a great being like that has walked on this earth. Mm -hmm. And his, his life and his existence has harnessed lots of energy on that level that somehow now 2000 years later Christian, Christianity is still existing even if they will <laughs> say a lot of things that Jesus didn't say but throughout the ages still people could open up to Jesus and get comfort and get connection with the divine with God mm -hmm. It's the same like a Hindu who with innocent faith opens up to Shiva, somehow deep down knowing that Shiva is an appearance, but behind that is that unexplainable divinity. And through opening to that Shiva appearance, manifestation, connecting with that pure divinity throughout the centuries, so many Christians, they could connect with God by innocently opening up to Jesus. Mm. Yeah. That is certainly there. There is such a big power there. I'm sure Jesus in all this time has become more, also more powerful and is still there and helping people like there are other wonderful, great beings who are doing the same thing. I feel a very personal connection for the first time with him when, actually, when I was started doing this meditation practice about seven years ago, that was the first time that it felt personal. And I had uh, like some seconds in one of the meditations where it felt my heart was just pure love. And I felt the connection with him. I'm calling it him, but you know, um, there was no historical Jesus for sure. Mm -hmm. It was a being beyond the physical. And I felt that that it felt as if that was the maximum of uh, love that I could experience. It was just seconds, but it moved me tremendously. And then the therapy started when, I mean, the therapy started when I met my teacher seven, about seven years ago. Then it was when I felt, okay, I don't need to miss Jesus. Because in my heart, there was that missing, that great being, you know, that incarnation. And then when I met my teacher and I experienced unconditional love, it was like, okay, I can let go. Um, now it's the present. And then, of course, my teacher... My teacher's work is all about taking me to my inner teacher, which is what you were talking about at the beginning, which is finding the source of love within myself, the divinity within myself. So it's a beautiful journey. I just feel that perhaps now I'm touching on these very deep layers of childhood, you know, where there are still like uh, some still that, that, yeah, a lot of fear, so much fear, because in Spain at the time it was the church and the government together. We had 40 years of dictatorship in which the government was fully supported by the church. Yeah. So we got control throughout, you know, yeah. <laughs> at school, in, in the church, and, and the indoctrination was very deep. And I feel that the healing for me is coming now at a very deep level and yeah. Yeah, that's very good. When it comes up and sometimes shakes you up a bit, don't get uh, insecure because of that, but rather, okay, it's good that it comes up and it's time to let it go. It certainly leaves mark if you grow up, marks if you grow up like this. But then when you become more conscious, then you can 
let go those aspects that are not helpful at all and keep those that are helpful. Yes, thank you, because the, in the Bible, I do find that there is this mix. There is a mix of, of uh, manipulation, but there are some great teachings coming through as well. So, yes, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Thank you, thank you. Jesus' teaching was love, love, love. Yes. And then after that, they made it uh, all that sinner stuff. <laughs> yeah. And he actually says, I only, uh, some years ago, I realized he says, love one another as I have loved you, but also, amarás al prójimo como a ti mismo. In English, I'm not 100% sure how to translate, but it's, you will love thy neighbor as you love yourself. Yes. There is that, which I really, it didn't get in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so now I'm taking it in. <laughs> very good, very good. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you so much, Anna. Hariom. Hariom, Hariom. <clears throat> Hello, Nava. Hi, uh, Werner. Um, thank you, Maria, first of all, for, uh, I, I just want to continue with um, what you've been talking about, um, because I come from the Jewish tradition, it's the same thing, God punishes and God rewards, and I feel that I've left that behind. Yes. My, my great difficulty is God is always, in the Bible, so different than us. He's supposed to be out there and totally separate from us. Mm -hmm. and, and so when you talk about the essence, I, I have a lot of difficulty. Is God out there? Is God in here? I, I can't seem to, um, to get beyond that. And it's something I struggle with. Yes. And, and perhaps yes. again, it's just that it's been so ingrained that we pray to God out there. Right. Mm -hmm. can, can you say something about that? Okay. Of course, that's how we have heard it all the time. And it's always like God, you're looking up <laughs> Some, yeah. somewhere out there. We are not quite clear where, but somewhere out there. <clears throat> And of course, God is also there, but not somebody who sits up there <laughs> far away and somehow through spy holes <laughs> is, is watching us down the hill. <clears throat> God and the creation are one. God, the creation is an expression of God. And so is everything and everybody is an expression of that same divinity. There is that living essence that the, is making everything possible. That living essence that makes a seed that we put in the ground sprout and grow up in a plant. You can say it's only nature. Nature is doing that. But what is nature? <laughs> we just give a, give a name to what we are observing, that the plants are growing and the trees are beautiful and we call it nature. <laughs> but that there is that living quality. And it's that which is making everything possible in our daily life. That because of which we can breathe that with, because of which we can think and feel. There is an Upanishad, the Ken Upanishad, who starts, what is it that makes a human being take the first breath? <laughs> and then it goes, goes on talking about it. It's not the conscious, it's not the subconscious, it's beyond. It's not what you are worshipping, but it's that by which you are worshipping. It's not what you can think of, but that by which you can think of. 
it's that which makes everything possible. So it goes on for some time, uh, repeating basically the same idea. If we just stop, And then there comes the urge to think, there comes the urge to do something, but there is that, that living energy there, that conscious living energy there, who somehow moves all this. And that is not apart from God. So God is here, God is there, God is everywhere. God is not a person, but is that divinity, that inexplainable, divinity that makes all this possible and all that comes out of the first expression of God which is pure consciousness and pure love and pure energy which is the ground of manifestation of creation and all that comes out of it is an expression possible only because that divinity is there as soon as you take away it's gone, nothing is there. <laughs> so, if you feel somehow limited because of the indoctrination that God is out there, then see that feeling when it comes and you feel what, what God here is strange, then just watch that feeling that it creates. Watch what it is doing to you and learn to relax and not take it serious anymore. It doesn't mean it's wrong to pray to God. If that is a way that is most comfortable to connect with divinity, it's still all right. But we don't have to limit it for it as being somewhere out there far away, but become fam more familiar with God, <laughs> more intimate with God and become aware, right? It's here, it's now, without that divinity, I couldn't say a word here. This whole experience wouldn't be there. This whole scene we are experiencing now would not be there without that living support all the time. Lately, because uh, things have been so difficult in Israel, I've found myself recently praying, which I have never done. And then I feel silly because I think, who am I praying to? It, it's it, it's yeah. exactly yeah. this. It's like, am I praying to a God out there? That doesn't make sense. Am I praying to a God in here? That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't need to make sense. If it's coming from the heart and you feel it is mm -hmm. right, then it is right. It need not be logical. <laughs> I was in, when I came to Amma, I was a stout Advaita follower. <laughs> mm -hmm. But still, I couldn't help it. I kept on screaming to God <laughs> that something should happen in my life. It was there and, and it was also not something I felt I have because of my Advaitic conviction to suppress. If this comes spontaneous, natural, and then after that you start to think about it and feel a bit silly about it, then you can just tell you, so what, it doesn't need to make sense. But in your heart, with your prayer, you connecting with that divinity. Even that divinity doesn't need any words. For you, it's helpful to connect at that moment to burst out with those words. Nothing wrong with that. It, it feels like it comes from the heart. Right. But what also bothers me is I'm asking for something. And what I mostly ask for now is that the people I love be safe. Mm -hmm. And even that doesn't feel right, even though it's what everybody wants now. But it, even that doesn't feel right to be asking for something. Um, 
just don't get obsessed and don't be, become slowly a beggar in front of God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> give me this, give me that. But mm -hmm. that, that thought, that sankalpa, that keen intent, that uh, giving that into the current of existence that somebody be saved, that uh, is absolutely nothing wrong. You can very well pray for your loved ones that they be saved, but then uh, you may also, that is not a contradiction. You can uh, pray for them, but then you may also expand it and pray for that this whole madness stops and everybody is saved. Mm -hmm. But it's nothing wrong if it spontaneously come that uh, you pray for people you know. This doesn't do harm to the others, but it gives a positive energy in the current. But then uh, if the doubts come, then you can expand your prayer for everybody who is involved in that whole meaningless struggle there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I do that and then it feels much better. Yes. yes. Yeah, it feels so much better. Um, I wanted to ask you something about something else. Yeah. As well, um, I'm reading, um, I am that Nisargadatta's book. Yes. And I don't get it. Most of it is just not my experience, and yet I keep reading it. Yeah. Um, I keep wanting to read it, but most of the time I, I read and I think, well, I've never experienced that. And yeah. sometimes I think I don't even know what he's talking about. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you think there's value in, in reading him anyways? If you if you think, if you want to read it, yes, there is still value in it somewhere, some Thing is still touching you but you need not think that you should read it because it's supposed to be a good book <laughs> and an inspiring yeah. book if you feel oh no I don't feel but you don't have to force yourself to read it because it's supposed to be a helpful book for sadhaks but if you feel like reading it even if you don't get it it, if you think that you don't get it, you can continue reading it and it still will do something, even if on the intellectual level you think sometimes it seems to be a bit strange what this guy is talking. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> no, I read it because somehow I want to. I tried reading um, books by Ramana Maharshi. I couldn't read them. Yeah. And I just put them down, but the Sarkadata I keep reading. Yeah. His, but, but, his, but language is more, his language is more down to earth. Huh? <laughs> I couldn't even explain it on that level. It just somehow, I don't understand either of them on the whole, but this yeah. is different. I just seem to want to read it. Actually, the, these kind of books, they are not really to understand. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Many times you read something and it makes click and you understand some detail on the way that is helpful, that understanding. But it's more that if you open up your heart and read their conversation, then you somehow connect with that space where the teaching is coming from, mm -hmm. which, is beyond, which is beyond words, which is not logical, which is not something to be understood. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. So you can very well continue to read it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and get benefited by it, even if you sometimes think it's strange what he talks. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Thank you. You are welcome. Hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up. Is there anybody else who would like to come in and say something? Yeah, hi. Hello, Leela. So, so many um, words about love of Jesus and love of uh, God, and um, just didn't mention Muhammad here. And also, they say that um, 
most of the wars or maybe all of the wars in the history are due to wars between um, religion, religions. So how come um, there is so much evil and cruelty um, okay so there are wars which is a bit strange if the gods are so full of love and people follow gods and then they fight among each other each, others, each other and then there's a war and then there is so much cruelty there and evilness. Do you want me to talk or do you want to say more? Yeah. No, I, I started by the how come and then I said, so how come, yeah. How come that actually in the history, most of the wars, there are somehow, somehow religious wars. It, yeah. Yes. Connected, yeah. Yeah. Because there is, in this creation, in this world, there is a very negative, destructive force. The polarity has to be there for creation to be there. Without the polarity, there is no creation without without the positive and uh, negative charge in the atom there is no atom there is no manifestation of the atom but as long as it's in harmony then it's not destructive but there are also powers that have cut themselves off as good as they could Nothing can really totally cut off from that ultimate divinity, but they can cut themselves off of the benevolent aspect and the harmonious aspect, the creative aspect, and somehow become powerful to some extent in that. And these dark powers, they have been very much active in our known human history. That somehow they could manifest themselves and influence people and so also the religions have been very much influenced by that. That people believe in a religion and, and say things like God is love and then they go out and fight for that religion. But there has been always other interests behind that. People simply have been manipulated into that. But there have been other interests behind who really were pulling the strings and pushing people into this kind of fanatic fanatism to fight with each other in the name of God, then the person who does that can somehow feel more just justification doing bad things because it's for the sake of God, <laughs> believing that uh, they will be forgiven if they do this cruelty in the name of God, which of course is complete nonsense. Cruelty is cruelty and destructive stuff is not a spiritual uplifting action, even if the person who does so in religious favor believes that this is the religious duty to do so, but they are influenced by these dark destructive forces. Simply, these dark destructive forces, they like to use religious words and ideas and emotions and concepts to to give the people the feeling that they are justified to do so, not being aware that actually in when they are in that 
religious destructive fervor, they are very much disconnecting from that divinity, not doing the service of that divinity. It has been very strong like this for a long time, but that area is coming to an end, I can assure you. And now, before this is ready to let go, it's manifesting even worse for some time, desperately holding on with the fingernails, trying to stay here and con getting total control. Actually, the, the last years were step by step by step, and it goes on that there will be, a, the attempt is there to gain a total control about all the humans so that it has not to go, but it's a lost battle for that side. It, it has to go. I just don't know how long it takes. But it's not the God, the love, the divine love, who is making people go to war for the religion. It's, it's the other side who is using sometimes religious words and gets people befuddled that they start to think it's their duty in the name of religion to do atrocities. <laughs> You said the other side, you meant this the, the black powers? Yes. When you said now the other side. Yes. So it's not personal, like it's not uh, like me, 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 or like when the personality comes in and then sometimes it, it activates us rather than when we are less me, me, me. It's more, it's not personal. It's like a whole, um, yeah, a group of people, like. It's a group of people. It's a impersonal force, but it's manifesting on the physical level and on subtle levels also in beings who are totally possessed by that. And they are, yeah. and they are very much have been in power in this world and shaping the politics very much, and they are doing at the present time still. Oh. But uh, everybody, uh, you said, when we slip into that me, me, I, me, mine, and it becomes like consciousness becomes contractive, then. It's like we are opening at least a little bit up to that negative influence. And the more we can like, get rid of that, which makes consciousness contracting, but helps it to be expensive, the less this kind of negative dark influence has any chance to come anywhere near, or let alone to overwhelm people and, and control them. Yeah, it's very sad what now I understood from what you said, and um, uh, yeah, it, it's very sad because um, I just wonder specifically in Israel, such a, it's a small country and like everybody knows everybody and like if there is somebody who I identify that they are a bit fanatic in, in their religion, I, I always wonder if I could connect at all. Um, I admit now here. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just, yeah. You need not connect with their words or actions, but can uh, very well see yeah. they are not beneficial. At the same time, still develop the awareness even if it's deeply buried, <clears throat> that divine essence is still there. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then I should be careful with how much, yeah, how much I I connect, how much I go. It's a, it's a, it's an art. <laughs> it's an art. I'm learning to do it. 
I'm learning to do it, but it, it's an art, definitely. To identify and then to, to make the borders in advance, to put the borders for myself in advance. Yes. It's a bit, it's, it's rather tricky, but the way you explain it, it makes it um, okay, okay to do it like that. But they basically mean we need not stand in judgment over that being, yeah. but see, that yeah. being is totally befuddled. But uh, uh, basically, it's that being has become a victim of uh, a complete misunderstanding, mis misdirection, and then starts to like it and gets completely sucked in and does atrocities and pushes and pulls the strings that there is more destruction and we need not in any way uh, excuse and and uh, e not think that those actions they are justified they are not we need not support their actions and can very well see their actions are totally wrong and they should not necessarily be in the power position they are because there they have more possibility to do mischief without then getting into that destructive mood of condemning the being as as an evil being, because it's also hurting ourselves when we are doing it. Well, yeah. Just uh, something <laughs> a bit connected, but now there are things became complicated with the uh, Hamas about uh, bringing back all the people that were kidnapped. So Israel went back to to the war, and actually Israel. <laughs> somehow is planning to kill all, all the people, kill all the people and empty Gaza and uh, like, I don't know the words to say it. Uh, but some of these people also don't care that some of the kidnapped people will stay in, in the hands of Hamas. It's more important for them to kill all, all the people and to Diminish, can I say? Diminish Gaza? Mm -hmm. yeah. T together with the kidnapped people. Yeah. Anyway, I'm just saying that this is so, com yeah, it's just so difficult and co so complicated that people want to kill everybody as if it's like will solve any problem. Meantime, they are neglecting what they have to do is to bring all the kidnapped people back to Israel. Um, it's not an opinion, I'm just um, sharing my pain. Yes. And yeah, it's, just totally, sharing my pain. it's totally a manifestation of that destructive force. From the beginning, the whole thing has been a total manipulation of the people, of putting them into that mood now, revenge and all that. And once people are in that current, they have the tendency not to think clearly and not to open their heart and feel. But of course, this is a total manifestation of exactly that destructive force that is there worldwide, very active and doing all kinds of mischief. And what you are saying is totally right. How, how is it possible that people, instead of wanting that this is finished, rather want to be, remain in a bad situation simply to have more destruction, that simply means they have been so totally overwhelmed from that destructive dark side that their thinking and feeling has become so and conduct, uh, conduct of it. Yeah. But we, each one, we can work against it. When we see that this kind of feeling comes like uh, 
revenge thoughts, revenge feeling, and all that, that we, instead of nurturing them, that we see them, see what they are doing, learn to let them go. Not artificially try to laugh what is going on, but simply come back in our own natural state. And there, the more you are doing that, the more light, love, harmony is radiating by itself. Each one can contribute to that. And if we see that other people doing that exact opposite, then that should be not uh, something a reason to condemn them, but a reason to encourage us to do it even stronger. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I understand. I understand that. I've heard it from you many times in connection to other subjects, and uh, revenge is something that I definitely don't support. And uh, and I've, I have been doing what what you just said. Now you say it to me. Oh, oh, <laughs> All, um, almost in, in every meeting. So I, I have been absorbing it and yeah. So, yeah. Very good. Shall we leave it at that? Yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you. Hurry on. Hurry on. Hurry on. I wish you well. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, we are living in a strange time, in an intensive time. I have often just pointed to that. I'm never going more into details of observations, what, what is really going on. This is not the place in the satsang, but it's no place to close our consciousness to the fact that we are in a very turbulent, intensive time where there are very destructive forces, very active, but at the same time, very powerful, loving, harmonious forces are also very active. And once again, I'm saying it's in this time even more important that we are alert. Because in whatever direction we are opening, immediately there comes a lot of support. It's an opportunity for the individual to, within short time, go real deeper and deeper into their own resources. But if somebody willfully closes the eye, one can also get very badly pulled into negativity and it become destructive. So it's even more important than other times that we are alert and open towards truth, towards the essence, that divinity which automatically will bring about an experience of harmony and peace, even if outside it is not the case at all. Let's live like this. Let's make use as an individual of this intensity, of this opportunity. And incidentally, that's by far the best we can do for the rest of the world. I wish you all well. Are you? Are you? Are you?